Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning. Um, that was a pretty song. I like that. It brought me back when I was a little duffer up in New York. It reminded me of the snow and delivering newspapers. This one old gal, bless her heart, she used to always have a thermos. This lady put a thermos of hot chocolate out there for me and a whole box of cookies. Homemade these cookies. She did it all. And I'd sit there, and that was my great time. Whether she was out home and would come out or not, I was there, warm up a little bit, drink some cocoa, and eat them cookies, and I really much enjoyed that. But uh, our visitors are from Goshen, New York. I don't believe that's very far from Florida, New York, is it? There is a little town called Florida, New York. I bet you already know that. Anyways, on the back of your bulletin, this third paragraph here, I just want to read something from it. Um, I'm going to really read the meat of what I want to read is from the bottom of the third paragraph. But it says, conversion is a work that most do not appreciate. Then down here in the middle it says, he has a new mind, new affections, new interests, new will. His sorrows and his desires and love are all new. The lust of the flesh lust of the eye and the pride of life, which have hither, hitherto for been preferred before Christ, are now turned from, and Christ is the charm of his life, the crown of his rejoicing. Heaven, which once passed no charms, is now viewed in its riches and glory, and he contemplates it as his future home, where he shall see love and praise the one who hath redeemed him by his precious blood. Testimonies of the church. That's very good. I'm glad that Ricky fills the bulletins up. But that used to be just an empty space back there. It isn't empty anymore. That's powerful. That's really good. I enjoyed that. Okay, so um, the name of this little talk is um, Too Close for Comfort. And Brother Gary just read. 1 Kings 16.30 And Ahab the son of Amri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Well, that's a horrible record, isn't it? I mean, can you just think of a worse record to be written about you? Did more evil than all the people before you? I mean, how about, how about the record of Abraham? That's a great record. Huh? Or Moses, the friend of God. Don't you want to have a good record? I would want to have that record. That's, that's bad. <coughs> Turn your Bibles to Malachi. <coughs> Malachi. Malachi is the very last book of the Old Testament. <coughs> Chapter 4. And verse 5. When you all get there, just say amen. Amen. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I will send you Elijah, the prophet. Now let's go to Matthew 17, just one book to the right. Matthew 17. And I'm going to start reading in verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly has come first, truly shall come first, rather, I'm sorry, and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise, shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake to them of John the Baptist. You know, there is a church that has a job to do. They have an Elijah message. Do you know who that church is? Who is that church? Us. Absolutely. Why do we have this Elijah message? What is it about us that... that says that we have this Elijah message. The three angels' messages, right? Revelation 14, 6 through 12, correct? And what, what, what does that say? What's the meat of that message? 
the end of all things is at hand, right? As Peter says, right? The judgment is come. Let's turn back to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to start reading in 17. <clears throat> and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed, followed Balaam. Have you ever been called a troubler? <clears throat> You've been called a troubler of Israel? I hope so. Because if you are, then you're doing your Elijah message. Right? Because most of the world isn't following the Bible. Are they? No, they follow tradition. They follow things taught of men. They follow, well, my pastor says this. Oh, did your pastor die for your sins? Oh, 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 what do you mean? Well, who are you worshiping? Right? We should study our Bibles and know Jesus Christ, right? He in, in whom we have to do. And by whom all things consist and have their being. The Lord Jesus Christ. You know... I understand people looking up to their pastor and stuff, and their pastor is supposed to be a good leader, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't take anything any pastor says as gospel. The, the, the Bible says, Paul says, go back and search for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Look, seek, line upon line, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. Isn't that how we understand we can't take things out of the Bible and just build a whole theology on it. We have to understand the whole Bible and take it all into context. That means every book of the Bible, even the things that are hard to understand, they have to be, they have, we have to dig in and pray that we would understand these things. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians. Chapter 5. All right, Galatians. The wind is fighting my Bible, but I will win. Because I'm vigilant. Alright, here we go. 5, 23, and 24. Now, Pastor's been preaching on some of this, and he's been, I guess I, I, I see why he likes to go down there, because he can have it all on board, he doesn't have to have his Bible, and the pages don't fly back and forth on it. Anyways, from 23, 523, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So God has a certain order here, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Yes. And our, our church is struggling over some things right now with women's ordination and, and you know, where do you, wherever you land on that. Um, the scriptures, I think, speaks plainly to where we should be. And, but, you know, much of the church is like old Israel. You know, well, they, they all have kings. Why can't we have a king? Right? And, and Jesus is the one that's pushed away. When the order that he says to go by is not followed. I'm not saying that any woman can't do just as good a job as any man. That's not my point. My point is that, that God has given certain roles for us to play. Alright, let us, let us turn... I will turn it all over. Luke 4. Luke 
chapter 4 and verse 25. I'm going to read from 25 to 30, Luke chapter 4. But I tell you a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Seraphim, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, Elijah, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Filled with wrath. And rose up and thrust him out. Who did they throw out? Jesus. Jesus. Out of the city and led him unto a barrow of a hill, or a, a, the ledge, or an edge, whereon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Now, why do you suppose that the Bible says that they were filled with wrath when God speaks the truth to them? Filled with wrath. Stepping on toes. Pardon me? Stepping on toes. Stepping on toes. How about these people that were supposed to be children of light weren't really children of light? They were of their father, the devil, as Jesus said they were. Because if they were children of the light, brothers and sisters, they would have been pricked in their heart. Right? Because when God condemns something or shows you a wrong, what do you do? Do you get filled with wrath? Or you confess and turn away from the wickedness? You see? Children of the light go to the light, right? Children of darkness, what happens when the light comes? They got to either kill the light, right? Or run from it because it exposes their deeds that are evil, as the Bible says, correct? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. There are people out there. Let's turn to John. John chapter 3. And beginning in verse 15, you guys should be quite familiar with some of these verses here. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You can all say this one with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Did the scribes and Pharisees believe? No. No. So what happens if you don't believe? You're condemned already. And you're going to hate, aren't you? You're going to hate the light if you're not a believer. The Bible's pretty plain. Because he has not believed in the name of God, the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Who gets the glory? The Lord Jesus Christ. Right? He's the good man. He's the only one. You know, the very best work that any of us could do if it would be laid before God, the angels would cry, they would veil their faces. 
God only accepts absolute perfection, brothers and sisters. You and I on our very best day could not do that, could Amen. not give that. But it has been given for you Amen. in the life and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Everything that need be done has been done. Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles now to 1 Kings, 1 Kings 21. And I'm going to begin reading at the very first verse. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel hard by the place of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me the vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me, that I should give the inheritance of my father unto thee. And Ahab came into the house heavy and displeased because of the word of Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down upon his bed and turned away his face and would not eat bread. Huh. What do you suppose that this vineyard represents? You can't buy this vineyard. And I will not give it to you. It is of my father's. I think that Ahab saw this uh, Naboth in the vineyard very happy. I think he looked and saw him down there and it looked like a piece of heaven to him. I think that I would like to suggest to you that this vineyard represents even salvation, okay? It can't be bought. And it represented that to this king, and he wanted it. And he was going to just, just do whatever he could to get it, but not what he really needs to do to get salvation. And what's that? Surrender. Right? I surrender all. Now remember what we talked about, about the good order of things and how people have positions that they're supposed to play? Well, let's continue to read here. And it says in verse 5, But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her all these things, blah, 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 you know, all about that. In, in that verse 7, And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Does thou not govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal, and sent letters unto the elders, elders, corrupt elders. And to the nobles that were in his city dwelling at Naboth, and she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Beel, before him, to bear witness against him, basically liars, saying that thou didst blaspheme God the king, and then carry him out and stone him, that he may die. So what do you suppose happened? They did exactly as Jezebel had said. So this righteous man is killed. And what happens? Ahab goes down to possess. And then we go into uh, verse 16. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of. This is a sad thing, that Ahab is such a weak man that he allows his wife to 
do these kind of things. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with a strong woman. I like strong women. Okay? Don't get me wrong here. But a strong woman, if she's stronger than her husband, then she should seek to build him up, to help him, right? Not take things in her own hands, especially doing deals like this. But I think we realize that Jeze Jezebel is a prophet of who? Baal, right? So she is an elder, a priest, a, pro a priestess of a corrupt, corrupt church, religion, whatever you want to call it. In verse 17, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tisbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he is going, where he is going down to possess it. And thou shalt speak to, unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall the dogs lick the blood even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that, look, they're talking about men there, and him that shutteth, shutteth up and left in Israel, and will make thine house the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Bashan, the son of Ajiah, for the provocation where, where thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab, him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But Ahab, when he heard these things, it says over in verse 27, And it came to pass, and when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes, and put sackcloth upon his flesh, and fasted, and laid sackcloth, and went softly. And the Lord, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. This is amazing. The Lord is dead serious when he's talking about things, isn't he? <coughs> does, does, does the Lord give us plenty of room? Look at Ahab here. Look what this, the, this guy has allowed to happen. The evil that the Bible says that he's done. And, and, and he simply repents just a little bit. And what, what does God do? He, he's such a merciful God. He's such a loving God. People paint this picture of God, that God is like this guy that's just out to get us. He's constantly ready to poke you. Are you kidding me? This is a God that is so full of love that he's, he's poured out heaven to save you. He's pleading, pleading with us. We don't even understand that love. If Ricky and I and uh, Mary Jane was talking in the pastor's study this morning, a little illustration that I that I came up with. You know, when a young man, when, when people are young, young man, young woman, high school kind of age, maybe, how the woman just, the young girl just loves a man. And he's just like, you know, but she just gives that man her heart. You know what I'm saying? You've seen it. And the guy's like, God's love is like that girl's love. It doesn't care how she's treated. She's loves that man. You follow what I'm saying? I've tried to give you all illustrations fall flat. And he just disrespects. You know what I mean? You know the guy 20 years later when he grows up he looks back and he says, man, what an idiot I was. But you know, God has always, his love is more powerful than anything we can see or understand. And he's constantly trying to woo us, to bring us back. Will we hear? 
He's simply wanting us to hear. If we will truly listen, God can fix everything. He can. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Kings 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and withheld how he had slain the prophets with the sword. Hmm. What happened? Remember what happened? Elijah took all these prophets up, right? Up to Mount Carmel, right? I'm not going to take time to read all through that because it's just going to take too much time. What happened? They had the prophets of Baal and Elijah, right? So you have this great company and Elijah. And he says to the people, we're going to make sacrifices up here on this mountain. And whoever God answers by fire, he is God. Right? Yeah. So the prophets of Baal have one bowl and he has the other bowl. They're preparing. And he says, look, there's many of you, Elijah says, so you guys go first. So they're calling out to their God, Baal to answer by fire of the sacrifice that they've made on the altar that they've made. And nothing happens. So they start cutting themselves. Because that's what false religion leads to. Death. Self. They, they think you're some kind of self-God, but you're not, you're not God. You never will be a God. There's only one God. So Elijah's picking and prodding at him. He says, well, maybe, maybe Baal's asleep. Maybe you should holler louder. <laughs> right? Well, nothing happens. So then, the Bible says, at the time of the evening sacrifice, God's timing is always perfect. Perfect. <laughs> he lays the bowl cuts it up, makes the altar with just stones. Just stones is what he makes the altar with because God doesn't want man's hand defiling anything. You follow me? The Bible talks about, pardon me? Yes, he does. He lays the stones up to make the altar. He lays the, the animal and he digs his trench around. It says that it can be filled with two measures of seed. It's a pretty good pretty good little mold. And then the Bible says that they pour water over the sacrifice and all over the altar and it fills up the mold. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything about where that water came from. Because you've got to remember, Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years. They're on top of a mountain. But you got to get that water up there. It's amazing things. Anyways, so at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah prays. He prays that if God, who is the true God, would answer by fire. And, and, and God does. And the Bible says that it licks up the sacrifice, the altar, the water, everything. And the people all holler. The Lord, the Lord, He is God. And Elijah says, grab the prophets of Baal. And he takes them down on the mountain, and what's he do? Elijah kills every single one of them. Bless you. I think my arms would be tired, killing 450 people. You think your arms would be tired? I think that'd be a supernatural thing to keep your arms moving like that. It's not a picture people really want to paint. That's what the Bible says. Anyways. We need to make time, brothers and sisters, for putting on the armor of God. We need to, sac we need to, 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 to walk away from these, the gods of this world. Okay? And serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And Him alone. And whom you have to do. 
There's only one. There always has been only one. <clears throat> Zechariah 4.6 So they threw her down, and some of the blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and trod under foot. Hmm. <laughs> did, you, did you hear that? You know, she was probably a very beautiful woman, I imagine. You know, she's married to a king. But did you hear who threw her out the window? Eunuchs. Some eunuchs. So all her little charms had nothing to do with them eunuchs, did it? Didn't have any effect on them. Isn't it kind of funny? Who God used to serve that purpose? With all her little bag of tricks, it did nothing for them. Not a thing. They picked her up and threw her out the window. You know, as I said before, the woman represents a church, brothers and sisters, God's looking for some men that won't be dazzled, okay, by the batting of eyes. You follow me? Verse 34, And when he came, and when he was come in, he did eat and drink, and said, Go ye, now this cursed woman, and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. Brothers and sisters, there's false churches everywhere. And let me tell you, if you really look deeply into this picture, Jezebel, who represents the false church, is married to or in bed with the king, the government of the true church. You following me here? You see what happens? What happens? Brothers and sisters, we are at the very end of time. There are things going on 
right now that are just absolutely unbelievable. So it's just more and more, faster and faster. Time is short. We need to seek the Lord and stop playing with these stupid games and allowing ourselves to think that we're immune to anything. Because you don't even realize that so much propaganda is, is everywhere in everything that we do. It affects the way we think. It affects what we see, how we relate to each other. And people don't even, they, they don't even think, oh, well, it doesn't bother me. <coughs> yes, it does. We are programmed, brothers and sisters. We are a product of our environment. Okay? So seek the Lord early and allow your steps to be laid out. Because you cannot walk on your own. You cannot. The Bible says so. What happened to Jesus right after he was baptized? He was led right into the desert, wasn't he? Forty days and forty nights. Completely tempted of the devil. No food. Do you think you can handle that? I don't know. Forty days is an awful long time. Only in Christ. And then we are going to need the Lord to get through these end times. Brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm hoping to wake them up. All right? I hope you all are woken up because the Lord is coming soon. And the falseness is all around us. In the Bible, you know, Ellen White says that, that, that these people are going to flood into the true church. They're going to flood in. But you know, it breaks my heart that she also says that many that are here are going to leave. Why? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Our closing song is 633.